Good morning, everyone. It's Kelsey Gallant from the PSP Central Office. I see a few of you online. Can anyone hear me? Hi, Good morning, Kelsey. Good morning. Good morning, Kelsey. Good morning. I heard Bruce, I think Candace, maybe Merlin. Okay, so you can hear me, that's good. Um, so it's nine and I know um, we'll get started really shortly here. I'm just, I'm not seeing um, Andy Lee from IntraHealth. He hasn't logged in yet, so he'll be doing the presentation this morning. So we'll just have to wait for him and I think there should be about four or five others logging in. So just bear with me for a sec here. Andy, it's Kelsey. Can you hear me? Are you on the phone? Okay. Good morning. Did a few people just join? It's Adam. Good morning. Good morning, Adam. Hi, it's Andy from Intrahouse. Hi, Andy. Uh, yeah, I saw that you were logged in, so I was just waiting for you to phone in. Good morning. Good morning. So, okay, I think most people are logged in. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get us started, and I'm just gonna sort of welcome everyone and open the session. and. Um, introduce Andy and also Bruce Hobson, who we have on the phone or on the webinar with us today. Um, so, okay, good morning, everyone. It's Kelsey uh, again. Um, so we're here this morning to look at the new automated um, report in the IntraHealth EMR for the PSP panel assessment, which is super exciting. Um, Andy Lee from IntraHealth is going to walk us through that report. And we've also got uh, Dr. Bruce Hobson on the phone and he's going to be available. Um, a lot of you might still have questions about, um, you know, well, what does this mean, sort of the, the clinical side of it. So if there's any questions around that, he of course has been very integral in helping put the assessment together, um, all, the, all the metrics in the assessment so he can help um, guide us through that a little bit, or kind of coaching you around the talking points if questions come up for the practices. Um, and I'm just going to sort of sit back and if there's any PSP related questions I can answer. Just a couple of things before we get started just around the process. We sent out some information to your leads and um, I never want to 100% assume that it all always reaches you the exact same way. So I'm just thinking out loud here that we should probably um, send some follow up. But essentially what we had, what we've done and asked is we have new automated reports now available for the IntraHealth EMR, also in um, MedAccess and Wolf EMRs. And what we talked about um, with the leads was sort of figuring out who might be our sort of first cohort of the team to go through. So that's you guys, you're here today for this first round of training. And also could we kind of work together strategically probably in some cases or lots of cases with divisions to um, target practices that we would want to approach to kind of go through this first wave. So essentially what we're trying to do is work with you guys to pilot approximately 100 um, clinics per EMR um, platform that we have the automated reports for before we release this more broadly, just so that we can um, really understand, well, what is the process? Do we have all the, the payment things correct? Is it the right amount of um, hours um, to reflect that? Um, are you guys you know, um, fully understanding how the reports are working and, and able to use those um, well, and do we have um, all the questions answered from the vendor? So it's, it's very much kind of in pilot phase. Um, now, we did send out some information to the leads about um, 
uh, how to, we need some information back from you guys. So once you are out there in the, in the field um, talking with practices and identifying practices that might want to go through this process first, um, we need to communicate back to the vendors some um, practice information so that they can actually turn the functionality on. So it's not going to be the case where it's available in every intra-health practice now, it's going to be, okay, we've got a, a practice that wants to pilot this, and then we'll have to send that information back to InterHealth, who will turn it on for them. And I might let Andy talk a little bit more about, about that part, but um, we'll need to work with you guys and the leads just to get a, a few key elements, mainly practice name, address. I think there's something called a clinic ID, um, but we'll send some more information out, and Andy might offer a little bit more around that. Uh, that's it. For me, from now, I did talk with Andy yesterday while we were preparing, and he encouraged everyone to ask questions as we go. So I'll be sort of moderating. If you want to use the um, the typing chat feature, I'll be monitoring that. Or please um, go ahead and and just interject on the phone. If there's any loud feedback, I may have to mute you, and I'll try to send you a note. Or if you know you're in a, in a place where there's um, some background noise, please just go ahead and proactively mute yourself. Um, I'll try to avoid having to mute you. And I think that's all for me, Andy. I'm just going to, oh, you are a presenter, great. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andy. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so for the patient panel assessment, um, there are three different areas in profile that you'll be accessing in order to run these reports. Um, so the first one that we'll start off with is the stored report. Um, how we can access that area is under report. Uh, you can go down the menu right here and select stored reports. And all you need to do is just double click on this one report here in the sandbox. Uh, basically what this report gives you is a breakdown of all your active patients into gender and age categories using standard age groups of five. So if I just double click on this report, it'll give me the breakdown of all my patients in their age groups and gender. Andy, it's Bruce here. Just a question. Um, is there uh, any graphical representation of this, or is it only going to be in a tabular form? Uh, it's only in this form that you see right now. Okay. Can it be exported? Uh, yes, you can export it by hitting print and then saving it as a PDF or Excel if uh, you have it installed on your computer. So you can export it in a, an Excel format and then uh, it can be made into, it can be represented graphically at that point. Yeah. If you know how to use the Excel to do that. Okay. And can it be exported to CSV or just PDF or Excel? Uh, PDF or Excel. Okay. Um, so the next area we're going to move into is the find objects query. Uh, basically, this report allows you to um, use like discrete searchable data, such as like patient contact information, including their address, postal code, and phone number. Um, how we can access that is under report again. You're just going to navigate to stored queries. And you'll see this one query right here for searchable patient demographics. Once you double click it, it's gonna prompt you to uh, add in some parameters. So if you know a specific patient's street address, postal code, and phone number, you can enter in all the values here. Um, once you've entered in the values, you just hit okay and then we'll search for that patient. Another alternative you guys can use for this is under patient, you can use find patients and use the criteria in this screen.
So Andy, can you walk back again, Bruce, again, can you walk back to the um, first screen under the uh, searchable patient demographics? Yeah. And um, so it's picking those parameters. Um, just talk a little bit more about just exactly what it's uh, picking in there. Okay, so the first condition, you're looking for the street address. So um, if you know the street address, you'd have to enter in the ask value here. So I'm just going to enter in my work address, see if it pulls something up. Um, the street address code, that's looking for the postal code. And the home phone number, you can enter in the number here. So. What this should be looking for is whether or not there is any street address, postal code, uh, sorry, any street address and or uh, postal code and or home phone number present yeah. on a uh, patient demographic. So um, what we want is a list of those patients for whom one of those three things is not present. Any one of those three things is not present. Can you just show us quickly how this report would uh, be run to do that? Um, I'd have to change some of the parameters inside of the report right now. Um, right now it's looking for all of this criteria, but uh, you can go inside and change it up by just right-clicking on the report itself and then going into open. Okay, so it looks like I've changed it so it's looking for a street address or a postal code or a phone number. Um, so ideally what we want to do, you understand that, what we want to do is for this report to show us a list of patients who do not have one of those three things, any one of those three things current, because the idea is that um, if a physician's office wants to contact a patient and those things aren't present, then it becomes a problem and time consuming. So we want to know ahead of time those list of patients where work needs to be done to improve, uh, to clean that up. Okay. Um, what I'll have to do is I'll have to tweak this report a bit and get back to you guys on that. I'll have it completed by the end of business day today. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Just so I'm clear, Bruce, this is Merlin. Um, so this is really just looking at the demographic cleanup. So if they change yeah. it so that uh, Andy changed it so that he's looking for null values in those fields, it's really what you want, Correct. right? Okay. Exactly. Yep. Um, and um, you know, even more nuanced to that, although, you know, and maybe this is something that you could ask out in the group there, but, um, you know, the ideal would be um, that we would flag all patients with a null result or we would flag all patients um, for whom these results have not been validated um, as being checked within the last what year, two years, whatever it is, um, because people move, especially in larger, uh, more urban areas. I'm just curious with the group, what they think of that second parameter. Yeah, that's something I've always sort of wondered how we could do that in the EMR, sort of have a, like a little flag on it to say when, the, yeah, those specific metrics, any of them were last edited, right? So that you knew, or I guess even if, but even if they confirmed, I guess not even edited, but you just, it really needs to be a flag that they confirm that it's still a valid address? Correct. Yep, exactly that. And, um, you know, the ideal place for that, considering that this is probably a task for the MOA, um, would be that that flag, that signal, would exist probably on the day sheet. Um, where the list of all the appointments is, so that uh, as a as a MOA is 
entering in a patient's information when they're talking to them on the phone, they would see that there would be um, no validation done in the last year, no uh, check to make sure that it's, or that the mail flag would show up right away in there. And that would fit best with the workflow so that you then wouldn't say, uh-oh, through this report, don't have a patient um, information here now, how do we contact that patient? <laughs> and then you're scrambling around. So ideally it would be at the point of service that there would be some notification about that. Those are good points, yeah, Bruce and Merlin. I've just made a note of that, so just so that we don't, just wanting to make sure that we keep moving along, but let's definitely revisit that and open to ideas if other people um, have any thoughts about that um, around the workflow that Bruce was just describing. Let's keep that conversation going and talk with IntraHealth about opportunities to do that. Thanks, Andy. Okay. And the last area that we're going to move into is um, the groups module and profile. Uh, how we can navigate to that area is under the work center. Uh, we're just going to click on the clinical tab right here. And we're going to select groups. Um, so what I did for the groups area is I created a folder. It's called the EMR panel. And here are your list of reports that you can run. Um, we'll go through each and every one of them, and I'll show you what it looks for in profile to pull the data. So starting off with the first report, uh, this report's looking for patients on 10 or more active medications. And what it looks for is under, if I right click inside of that group itself. Right now I have a macro that's built inside of this report where it's looking for all active medications that are stored so what I'll do, I'll run the group first and we'll pull the data in. So there's there's a question just for you, Andy, as this is running. Um, generally, how big of a database is, is, how many patients in this specific database that's taking about 45 seconds to run this report? I think I put in about anywhere from five to 12 patients per report. Um, it's just the uh, one no, that what is, what is the size of the What is the size of the base database? You know, the, the, the database that this is searching through to produce this report, sorry. I, I couldn't tell you, sorry. I, I think, I'm just curious, is this, running this report gonna take longer depending on the size of the database? Yeah. Or does it take? It will take so longer. That's, so that's just the question about if you have an idea about how long in an average practice that report would take to run. Um, because that gives the, right. yeah, it, it would give the RSTs a little bit of an idea of, of what they're going to do with that time as they're twiddling their thumbs waiting for the report to run. Um, yeah. We had some. Um, Bruce, we had um, we actually had two practices in Fraser that did um, beta test this. So I can um, I'm just scanning. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think we have either Aaron or uh, Shafali with us on the phone today, which is unfortunate. But um, I can um, the feedback was quite positive. Like I, there wasn't really anything specifically around. Um, it taking a long time, although I do believe that both of them did it after, um, like after kind of hours after they were done seeing patients for the day. Um, but I will get back to the group and let you know kind of anecdotally what the experience was. Great. I think that'll be useful just from a workflow context as um, how when you when the RSTs are working with a physician to be able to say whether or not this is going to impact anybody else's work that's currently going on, so as you said, should it be run after hours? And second, yeah. um, how long will running any one report take so that they have uh, something to fill that time with as the report is running? For sure, I'll get Andy. back to the group on that. It's uh, Adam here from the uh, CUNY Boundary. 
Um, are there differences between, is there a minimum of like bandwidth requirements that clinics do have when they hook up to the intrahealth system? I'm just curious because when we run reports in the past or specifically say downloading the chronic pain module during office hours, we've, uh, we, we've totally slowed down and we've had to not install it usually during office hours while there's many physicians on the system. Is it difference between different ge geographic areas? Is there minimum bandwidth issues or do you know? Uh, I think it all depends on what kind of PPN you guys are connected on. Um, again, I don't know about the bandwidth that you guys use out there. Uh, it'd probably be best if you spoke to our implementation person. Uh, he's the person that does know all about the bandwidth and stuff like that and slowness. Okay. Yeah. I can give you his contact info after. That'd be great. Adam, was that, sorry, was that Adam? Yeah, it is. Okay, so I'll, I'll, again, I'll circle back with the clinics that did beta this. Um, they're in the Fraser Valley, and I'll, I'll, I will ask if they can share what PPN they're on, um, just to give you a sense um, of what it looks like for, for them. That that would be great, just because I know we've had issues in the past, um, and I'd always err on the side of caution. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to see what they're doing, and see if it's, I really want to know is there a different geographic issue. Um, I don't know exactly why that would be, but it seems to be real in the East Kootenays, at least. It, it, for, it for sure is. So it's, it's a lot of things, right? It's the kind of PPN connection they have, and then the kind of sort of um, fiber that Telus has laid down in that in that area. So what the connectivity in general is in that in that area. So if they're having performance issues in general, um, it's it's likely due to that kind of infrastructure. Um, and if you're if you're having any practices that are having some serious performance issues, I just want just a little side note to flag. Um, the doctor's technology office, which is still it, it, it's a service that a legacy service from PETO, um, is still um, able to do help clinics with running diagnostics in the case where you know the vendor is kind of like, well, everything looks good on this end, and Telus is going, everything looks good on this end. They're still able to kind of remotely help um, really pinpoint where some of the can, the slowness issues can be. Sometimes it's within the practice itself. If it's running um, things sort of behind the scenes that it's not, you know, people don't realize they're streaming things or, or what have you. But anyway, that's the service that's still very much available um, to all all doctors. Great. Adam, just so you know also, there's some uh, tools that IntraHealth has so that the clinic should probably work with IntraHealth Closer. And they can run some metrics to look at some cleanup options to make sure that they're staying on top of that. Yeah, no, that would all be uh, all be beneficial. I'm not really in these CUNYs too much anymore. I'm more in the CUNY boundary, and we don't seem to have more clinics I'm working with. There, maybe there's six of the smaller clinics here. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd like to pass that information on. Um, and Adam, Bruce Hobson here again. Um, sorry I'm asking a lot of questions, but I um, just want to make sure that Everybody understands what it is that uh, is being done here. Um, you produ produced a list of patients who are on 10 or more uh, active medications. Um, can you comment a little bit about what the medications, what that means, active medications, what they're looking for? Is that um, short-term and long-term, only long-term continuous medications? Um, if you could comment to that. I assume that was for Andy? Yeah, I think yeah. I was just going to say, Andy, that was directed to you. Oh, yes, I, sorry, um, if I... Can you repeat that again? Uh, sorry, so um, just checking on what this is looking for. Um, this is looking for 10 or more active medications. Can you define um, what it's looking for as active medications? Are they medications that patients are on continuously? Um, does it uh, capture medications that are uh, short term um, that have just had a set limit or so uh, the criteria it's looking for in um, this report is if I just open up the medical record for the first patient right here and under the prescriptions area right here um, what it's looking for is the way this macro is written is if there is no finish flag 
Okay. Um, it's going to count that as an active medication. So under their usual medications list right here, we have three that don't have a finished flag. So that's what the question mark means. And under prior script, it pulls all this and calculates that as active medications. Um, so depending on the physician's workflow, um, they'll need to like put like a finish flag if they're not no longer on that medication so it doesn't count them as a patient in this report. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so if, so if for example, and it's just to be clear, um, if a physician is in the prescribing uh, window and prescribes say a short-term antibiotic for a week um, yeah. and puts that as 14 days, it's short-term, does that automatically put a finish flag on that prescription? It should. And if it's an opioid and they're prescribing, say, for 60 days um, and they can't put repeats on the, on the opioid prescription because it's a duplicate, how does that show? Um, will that show with the finish flag as well? And um, if so, uh, considering that that patient is coming back and renewing that prescription um, and it's always being one month at a time. How mm -hmm. does uh, InterHealth deal with that one? Uh, it's all built in, into the macros of the uh, prescription itself. So once you do your repeats and you prescribe it the next time they come in, it'll remove that repeat. So if you have three repeats and you're on your second one, you move on to your third one. Once you hit the prescribe the third one, it will automatically put a flag here, meaning that's complete. And again, um, we're open to suggestions on how you guys want to calculate these reports for the prescriptions because I know this was kind of like an iffy area on how people actually use prescriptions. But I noticed yeah. that most physicians don't come in here and actually finish, uh, put a flag saying that they're done with this uh, medication. So you notice that they just leave these medications in the list? A lot of people just prescribe and they just leave it as is. They don't come in and put finish flags into them. Okay, so that's something that should be, people should be aware of um, as part of the cleanup process as a maintenance. Um, this is something that should be done. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any questions regarding this? Report. Andy, I just have a question in general regarding uh, using groups. Mm -hmm. um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, but I think a lot of the work for the panel assessment is working potentially with a a single physician. At, yeah. Are you able to narrow it down? Like, I think when you run clinical groups, isn't it run for across the whole clinic, or can you split it up by a specific provider? Uh, we can split it up by a specific provider. Right now it's running across the board for all physicians or all uh, users on profile. Um, if that's a request you want, I'll just have to go in and modify these reports and just update the documentation for you guys. Yeah, I wouldn't mind knowing because I, like, I know like I was working in another clinic and I was looking like it's say a diabetes or hypertension mm -hmm. and I couldn't quickly figure out how to do it just for that specific physician. To get some of these uh, there, are, there are multiple ways. Do you want to connect after this um, session sure. and I can just show you? Yeah. Um, so, oh, Andy, it's yeah, helping. That, that's a good question, and I think everyone could benefit. So, I'm just wondering if once we we uh, we better understand what the sort of how you would do that, could we add that to the user guide? Yeah, I'll make the changes. Thank you. My sense would be to that point, and I think it's it's a very good point, that the default uh, should be for the individual physician because most of the RSTs will be working with an individual physician and uh, cleanup will be at that level. Um, however, it should be easy enough to open that up to look at the whole clinic um, or other physicians if necessary, but the default should be the individual. Um, would that be what the people that are on the line would agree to agree with? That's sort of my experience. Like I sort of, even though I, you know, it's individual, I, I try and work as a whole clinic, but then when cleanup's involved, 
you're really getting a, working with the physician a lot closer to say, hey, you know, this is the exact list and can we work, you know, clean up those meds like we showed in the past screen or are these really your diabetics and they don't really want to scroll through the whole clinic. And yep. Dr. Hobson, Tamara, that's my experience as well. Um, working with the clinic here in Terrace, so I've set up in the top filter section um, groups specific to each physician as well as the entire clinic. Okay. That, that's good to hear, Andy. So that would make sense that the default would be to the single physician, but that it would be easy enough to have instructions on how to open this up um, so the report could look at the whole clinic um, so that there's a comparison, if you will, in the, or an idea of what work that other physicians might need to do. Okay, I'll add that in the documentation. I'll have it done by end of business day today, and I'll send it to Kelsey so she can distribute it to you guys. Andy, it's Candace. Um, is it is it what I'm thinking? Because I was at a bunch of uh, big intra-health clinics yesterday, pulling all sorts of data in groups. And when when you're signed in as a staff or an MOA, and you can create filters for each physician you work for, and then you're looking at specific lists for specific physicians. But when you're signed in as a provider or a physician, you you automatically default to seeing your own. Is that correct? Um, I believe so, and there may be a role that you can enable to uh, grant that as well I, for uh, uh, like as a Because I think user. if you're an RSP and you're sitting with the doctor and the doctor is the one who's logged in, you're you're likely going to see just theirs. But if you're sitting with a staff doing it, then the staff needs to create a filter for each position that they're going to look at. Yeah, we can yeah. take yeah. care of that. Good point. Thanks, Candice. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of being clear in the in the sort of user guides exactly because either what the options are or just to be clear, you know, like you said, Candice, if you're logged in as this profile, you might see this, etc. So we'll make sure that that's all clear for you guys in, in the documentation. Okay. Okay. Um, Going. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next report. Uh, this one is looking for five or more active medications in a patient's chart. Uh, again, when depending on how big your database is and how many patients you have, and if the providers have been um, setting flags whether or not their medications are done, this could slow potentially slow down your system as you run it. Um, so you can see right here that I've clicked on run and now it's calculating all the patients. You may see duplicate patients in here um, between the five and the ten or more medications. So if I just open up the first patient in this list under their medical record and the prescriptions, it will calculate everything under the usual scripts that doesn't have a flag along with their prior scripts. So you can see that here are three examples that do have flags that they're finished and the rest don't have any flags so it calculates those into the report. Um, quick question for you, um, Andy. Uh, if you have, and I'm not saying you would, but if you had this list of patients, um, is there a way of generating a batch uh, task or assigning a batch 
uh, task or and or uh, say problem um, to that group of patients? Yeah. Um, so there's a function in here. It's called undocking. Uh, it's just right here. What this does is it pulls this group right here into its own separate window where you guys have the ability to add problems and mass alerts into the ones that you selected off. So if I select all my groups or all my patients in here, uh, I can quickly add a problem to it or I can add an alert, um, enroll okay. them into a care plan or just add like a recall for them. Uh, so the next report I'm just going to move into is patient status. Um, what this report looks for is um, that a patient has a primary provider and are assigned a status. So this report, the parameters is looking for anything that's null. Once I run it, it's a pretty quick report. So. It gives me my, my output down here. And if I just open up the alter patient just for a random patient. Sorry, can you just give me one second? So for this patient right here, it shows me that they do have a status and they do have a provider. So it's going to pull every patient that has these parameters um, inputted. So what we're looking for in this one would be patients, two things. One, um, that we're looking for patients that do not have a status or provider. So you're looking for the null in either of those fields. And the second is... is for me? Uh, it is looking for both of them. And if, if it's valid, then it pulls them into this report. So you want them to not be valid. You want them to have, you, you want the report to show the list of people who do not have an active status as one thing that you might be looking for or a, or a provider um, so that either a status or a provider can be added. Um, that's one thing. The other thing would be that you'd have the same report, but it would pull in anybody that's active with a provider who hasn't been seen in the last three years, because that's generally the list where most docs um, run into problems. Um, they have a list of, say, 5,000 patients that they have uh, listed as active that they are the provider for, but many have died or have moved away uh, or have changed to another doctor. Um, and we want to be able to take a look at that specific list of people who haven't been seen in the last three years. Okay, um, so I'll have to make a change to this and update it. So you're looking for patients who have either or and have been seen in the last three years? So we're looking for two things. One report would generate a list of any patients that don't have a status or prior or, or uh, provider so that they could be added if necessary. Um, the second report runs um, is looking for all patients that have both the status active and a named provider who have not been seen in the last three years. Okay, I'll make changes to this report and I'll add the second one as well. And so I just throw a question to the RST. Um, three years, as, as you know, is relatively arbitrary. If you look at the literature out there, they talk about uh, anywhere from 18 months uh, to three years as being the time period for which 
uh, you'd search uh, to find out if a patient has had an encounter or a visit with a doctor. Um, the shorter um, time period assumes that there's a higher turnover of patients. Um, but what we found in BC when we did pedo work was that uh, three years just seemed to be the right amount of time um, to take a look. And my caution is that there are many um, groups specifically of patients who um, don't show up uh, in a three-year period um, who might consider themselves as being active patients. And that's specifically around, um, you know, older children, uh, young males um, who typically don't come in or use the emergency room um, because they're more emergent problems. So just throw that out to people to see if there's any comments or thoughts about that. Yeah, um, that's sort of my experience too. It's really a tough call. Like I've asked them, I sort of mentioned that three-year window. Every physician sort of has a different take on it. Um, I, I think that's why I, I sort of like that whole idea of when the demographics record was last updated because I think then a clinic, they seem to be more interested in that and following up and then they could see the patient's age and know if they should follow up with that patient to say, you know, are you really still belong to this clinic rather than that whole three-year window to sort of monitor their active patients. I sort of got more interest that way of, to, A, they're cleaning up their data and always being in current and they're confirming they're active at the same time and that sort of then, that three-year window sort of went away after that. Does that make sense? Yep. Any, any other comments from anybody else? Because we do uh, find that there are some physicians with huge active list of patients who definitely are not all active. It's Candace. I'm uh, working on a project on the North Shore around patients, complex care and chronic management. And um, we found a workaround to find patients that were uh, potentially not active. So if you pulled a list of all active patients in groups here, and then there's a column on the display of names that says date of last contact, and if you click on the header, it'll put them all in order, and you can go to the people who haven't been in in the longest. And so I've had some physicians go through that and start way back, and, you know, you can see one mm -hmm. there that's 1994, 2005, 1992, and stuff like that, so, um, and exporting it and kind of working with that. But I find generally around three years is pretty comfortable for most physicians when they're looking at their lists and doing cleanup. They might pick out a name who hasn't been in in four or five years and say, no, leave them active, but they're, they're pretty good at knowing their patients. Candice, I think that's a really great observation and a great little tip that should probably be included in um, this documentation because I, I really love that approach of starting with the farthest back and then working uh, more forward to where the physician is comfortable with. That, that's great. I love that. Hi, Ken. This is Kelsey. I, I did catch that, but I'm just wondering, I'm sorry, I wasn't writing notes quick enough, just so that we can move on. Would you mind sending me uh, just a quick note, an email with some bullets around that so that I can work with Andy to make sure it's included? Yeah, sure. No problem. Thank you. And also, Andy, before, or is there any other questions about this? Or Bruce, did you want to finish any thoughts? I just have a question on the chat that I should ask. Nothing for me. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, um, we have a question, Andy, if um, the question is, have you used stored queries to find the medications instead of using a macro? Um, no, I went through the approach of using the macro, but you could use a query. I'd have to take some time to try and figure that one out. Uh, is that what someone's looking for? Yeah, that was the question. Um, it was from Tamara. Tamara, did you want to anything more further on that, or did you want to talk about about why, Andy? So, sure. Um, hi, Andy. It's Tamara. 
I just, uh, I, I did want to know if you used the stored queries at all for finding medications, just, just because um, you can easily see if they have an end date, the medications. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered if, if a person could set set the query to, to show all end dates of, of those medications to see the current ones. Uh, you could use uh, the query to run that. Do you want to connect after this call? Um, we can sure. Try to build one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No other questions for me, Andy? No, that, that was it from the chat line, too. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Um, so the next report we're going to look at is the palliative and end of life. Uh, so basically, this will list that the occupations with a diagnostic code of V66 in their problem list. So if I just edit this group itself, and under the filtering, it's looking for the parameter of a diagnostic code that's in the problem list of a patient's chart uh, with the code V66 right here. And how you can find out if they're coding it correctly is under the clinical details. Okay, under the problems tab right here, if they have a diagnostic code with V66, it will pull them into this list right here. So what we'll do is we'll just run this report. Okay, and then I'm just gonna click on a random patient right here. And if I go into the clinical details, as long as the code V66 is in that problem list, it's going to pull them into that group itself. And again, it will vary on how um, each provider is coding their problems. If they're not using V66 and they're just using like a string of text, you can search for that string of text by just altering the group itself. So if I just right click and hit edit, instead of looking for a specific diagnostic code under DX code, we can change it to a DX description and you can just search for a keyword. And my only note uh, to everybody on this is um, this is a difficult one, um, as Andy said, not everybody uses V66, and it's actually not a uh, MSP, it's, sorry, it's not an uh, ICD-9 code, it's an MSP code uh, for GPSC incentive billings that was agreed to. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a standard, um, it, uh, it could be variably used, um, it may more often be used in billing, um, for billing palliative care incentive fees. Um, but to that end, uh, you know, maybe what we're looking for, and we'll sort of define this for later on down the line, we've talked about this before, is that we're looking uh, perhaps more for people who are eligible for advanced life conversations. Um, and when we're doing the end of life refresh with Kelsey, um, we'll sort of be working with the vendors on how best we might uh, capture this in any EMR. Um, so just stay tuned, but uh, that's just my comment for this one. Thanks, Chris. Can I just ask a, a question, Bruce? Sure. From a physician's perspective, if if we're looking for V66, but the physician hasn't really been using that code, 
what other codes might we find if we're trying to identify these patients? What might we look under to start finding them? It, it depends on what you're looking for. If you look at the end of the life, end of life module and you remember at the top of the algorithm that there's four separate categories. Um, one is what's called a sentinel event. Um, somebody's, say, been admitted to the hospital with a heart attack or heart failure. Uh, another is um, that a patient has deteriorating lab values, like their, their renal function is dropping really low. Uh, another is that the patient self-identifies. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, it's uh, whether their, their uh, PPS, the um, scale of how the performance scale is low. Um, and so in order to pull all those things together, those would be people that you'd say are eligible for advanced life conversations. Um, as to a specific diagnostic code, because palliative um, is a care condition, not a diagnosis, um, it, it's describing a, um, a type of care. Um, you could have anything in the diagnosis from a type of cancer, like metastatic lung cancer, to heart failure, to, you know, uh, extreme bad infection, um, any or severe depression even. Um, any of those things could be palliative. So it's a bit of a difficult one. Um, and most physicians have a pretty good idea if you say, you know, who currently are you looking after that is truly palliative? Because it's usually only a couple at a time, at any one time. Um, eligible for advanced care directive conversations is going to be more relevant to patient medical home and a bit more challenging to document in the EMR which is why I'm sort of saying stay tuned. We'll have more advice and comments to that. So don't put a lot of effort into this one specific thing. Um, it will change and it's at this point um, an, an interesting exercise, but maybe not as useful as we'd like it to be yet. Okay, thank you. So go ahead, Andy. No other questions from here. Okay. So the next report is the frail elderly. Um, this one is looking for code B15 in their problem list. Again, if I just open it up, um, it's looking for B15. All I'll do is I'll just run it and just I'm gonna select the random patient. Under their clinical details, you should see with that problem V15. And as Bruce here again, another comment to this. This is some this is probably more relevant. Um, again, it's one of those codes when you see a V in front of it is not a true ICD-9 code. It's a created code by uh, GPSC for incentive billings. Um, and so it may be that this, is, this code will be discoverable in the billings rather than in the uh, problem list. That being said, um, so what, what do we look for? And um, this is again work that Kelsey and, and I and others will be uh, working on in the chronic disease management and um, the uh, chronic disease sort of module refresh. Um, and probably um, what will be the thing that's searched for is the, um, the uh, CHSA uh, frailty scale um, or depending on what other scale, whatever scale it is that the uh, GPAC group guidelines and protocols advisory committee comes up with as going to be the standard, that um, anything on the scale that is um, above uh, a certain number, probably, you know, uh, uh, anything above four will be the thing that will be used to identify somebody who is frail. Um, not specifically frail elderly, but frail. Um, so that's just a point. Um, again, uh, this is more relevant than the palliative. Uh, but um, is limited in 
just how physicians are going to use it and document it in their um, problem list, um, and it will likely be updated uh, when we do the module refresh on this. Um, so keeping you aware of that. This is Erin um, with Island Health. We've been doing some pretty intensive work in Cowichan on um, looking for frail elderly because that is our uh, first cohort of patients that will be attaching to the practice link teams with Island Health. And uh, I've found that physicians don't use B15 um, and often very few, I'm surprised, actually bill um, or knew that they could bill. And so we've been spending a lot of time having to find their frail elderly patients other ways and developing new parameters um, by sort of layering on diagnosis and age. And then now we're encouraging them to use the frailty scale um, and, yeah, looking at four and above. But the V15 is, is a tricky one because I'm really finding not very many people use it. Thanks, Karen. I, I would agree with that, and uh, and I, I think exactly the work that you're doing is is helping. It's going to help inform how we're going to um, work with the vendors on this and um, get some feedback from them as well as how we incorporate this into the EMR. Because as you all well know, um, for patient medical home, this is going to be a very important uh, group or registry or panel of patients to be able to identify. So uh, this, is, this is the current sort of thing that we have. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the EMRs don't yet record the frailty scale in a way that is um, uh, searchable. And um, so that's something that will be part of that refresh work that Kelsey and I and, and others are doing on chronic disease management. So thanks for that, Aaron. There's no other comments, uh, Kelty. I, I don't have any other questions on this. Great. Thanks, Bruce. We can move on, Andy. Okay. Uh, for the chronic kidney disease report, it's looking for uh, 585 in their problem list. So we'll just run it. And we can see that it's 585 in uh, this patient's problem list. Okay, for the drug dependent syndrome. So this is looking so for. Andy, Andy, before the drug dependence, um, just again as a, a flag to everybody, um, physicians may use other diagnostic codes other than 585 to describe uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, I'm just pulling it up quickly on the spreadsheet, unless you have it there in front of you, Kelsey, um, I'm quickly pulling it up. Um, sorry about that, folks. I would have had this in front of me. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now either, but I can look for it. Yep. Um, we do have a panel cleanup, uh, that spreadsheet that was sent out earlier, looking at, um, or quite a while earlier, looking at chronic um, kidney disease, um, was looking for 585, but there's a number of 58 um, codes, 582, 503, 476, that many physicians will um, record chronic kidney disease as, um, just to be aware that um, it's something that um, you may have to sort of look at and have that little discussion with physicians and look up uh, ITD-9 codes and, and see what their true meaning is um, and have that discussion with the physician on, on what they're recording uh, in there. So just as a note as a flag, the other thing is that um, many physicians may not even use um, uh, or know how to look for, uh, sorry, may not use chronic kidney disease in the problem list. 
Um, but if they, you were to search for um, lab values, so a, a GFR uh, of less than 60 um, or creatinine above a certain number, we'll have that kind of information for you um, as part of the hints of things to search for um, that help identify those patients that should be labeled uh, in a problem list with 585 chronic kidney disease. That's all I wanted to comment to there. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Okay, so for the drug dependent syndrome, um, right now we're looking for 304 that's coded in their problem list. So we just run the group. Here's the list of patients that have the code 304 in their problem list, and we'll just select a random one. And under the problems tab, we should see that coded into their um, list. Okay, for the alcohol dependence syndrome, Um, this one is looking for code 303. And if we run this one, you see code 303 in their problem list. Uh, for the anxiety report, Right now, I've changed it, so it's just looking for the description, so the keyword anxiety. And so you can see for this patient, I've just added in uh, code 50B, so it's just pulling, it's not looking for this specific code, it's just looking for the word anxiety in their problem list. And just as I mentioned again to folks, the, you'll see many uh, physicians that use 50B. Um, 50B is not uh, an ICD-9 code, um, however many people use it, um, and it is a very generic term, um, and people should be encouraged to uh, code differently rather than using 50B. Just a comment. For the ischemic heart disease, um, this one's looking for Oops. Sorry, I've added in a macro for this one. I need to change this. It's actually What this one should be looking for is code 414 in their problem list, or oh, sorry, this one is the uh, is looking for all your active patients with um, the following codes: 430, 433, 434, 435, and 436 in their problem list. So we built a macro. We can see all these codes right here. It's just looking for either or. And if we run it, again, you'll get this uh, little pop-up window where it's just trying to apply the macro. Andy, it's Tamara. I have a question about those macros. Yeah. Can, can you do, um, like I noticed that you could do multiple codes there. Can mm -hmm. you do codes that start with? I. Uh, Yes, you can. I'll need to find the string for that, and um, I can send that over to you if you need to make modifications to it. Okay. So, Andy, sure. it, it's Bruce here. It, sh it should be uh, looking for a code that starts with. If you look at the requirements uh, on the list, it's looking for IT9 codes that start with 414, that start with uh, 433 or so forth, um, because that just captures those people that enter in, say, 414.0. Um, 
So it, all those ones should be looking for rather than the exact term should be start with. And one quick comment on um, the ischemic cerebrovascular disease group, uh, 430 should not be in there. It should be 433, 434, 35, and 36, but not 30. So you can take out the 30 from that macro. Hi, everybody. It's Joe. I have a question when you're ready. Go for it, Joe. Okay. Um, um, so these are basically all um, single whatever uh, um, condition type of codes. Is there a way to do searches based on the complex care pairings? Because there, there's multiple different codes that can be used with uh, A414, for example, IHD and asthma. There's, a, there's different um, um, codes that fit under those. Uh, fit under those. Is there a way that to, to create searches um, based on the complex care pairing so that we could pull those up every, whenever they need to be pulled up, in January, December, or whatever, so that uh, to follow up with those patients? Because I did that with a practice in Whistler where we, we created all the pairings based on all the codes and pulled up all the patients. And there was, it took a very, very long time to create all those pairings because there are a lot of codes. Andy, that would question would be to you. Okay. Um, right, because there's a lot of codes that fit under, uh, sorry, A491, which is asthma and COPD, right? Or, uh, or I, I just pulled a bunch up, right? Right. So D430, diabetes and CBD. Uh, so CBD has other codes. Cardiovascular disease has other codes. Diabetes might might just be 250. I actually found that it, there's more than just 250, but CBD might have other codes. So when you're trying to pull up your pairings, how do you do that easily when there's so many other codes without creating some kind of search? Can I get back to you on that one? Yes, you can. That's where unions and intersections is really helpful, combining all those searches in there. Unions and intersections, okay? I'll have to find out what that is. We can, Andy, maybe we can add some information in the user guide about that. Thanks, yeah. Tamara. I'm not, I'm not familiar with those, what those functions are either, but maybe we can, Andy and I can take a stab at it, and if you have stuff um, to add, maybe you could review it, Tamara? that section? Absolutely. I built a whole bunch for our clinic here, and it's it's fairly robust to do that. Like, you're, you're pulling multiple codes, like sometimes a dozen codes all in, in together, and it takes takes a bit of time to build all that, and it, it's fairly robust to run it. So, um, yeah, but I don't, I would certainly support anyone that wanted to do it. I have a list of all the complex care qualifying codes. Um, that's how we started to do it in Whistler, but this unions and intersections sounds very interesting. Okay, thanks, Tamara. We'll, we'll put something to, well, Andy will probably draft something, not me, um, and we'll, we'll run it by you just to see if the language is making sense. Sounds good. Okay, so the next group we're going to run is the dementia. Um, what this one is looking for is for the DX code of 331. Okay, so if I just run that group, under the problem list, you should see 331 in there. So, Andy, just as an update for you, um, this would be looking for um, either ICD-9 code starting with 290 uh, or um, 
exact 331.0. So it's looking um, for people that have those uh, codes. So that's a, that's a change just um, that was in the last uh, documentation that was sent out in September. Okay. So starting with 290 or exact 331.0. Okay. Uh, moving on to osteoarthritis. Um, this one is looking under the problem list for diagnostic code 715, as you can see right here. And if we just run the group, open up uh, clinical details for random patients under problems, you can see 715 is coded under the problem list. For the heart disease one right here, this one is looking for uh, the actual word. So it's looking for the keyword of the, the heart disease in their problem list. And if we just so that, maybe... that that one, Andy, could be. Um, I mean, if people are doing it properly, it should be uh, starting with ICD-9 code four one four. And um, heart disease could be a number of different things. Um, so, um, should we just look for the with, keyword heart disease, or do you want it uh, to? Start? I would. I would look for the IC9 code starting with 414, rather than looking for a keyword. If people want to change it later to something else, the way that you've uh, shown, that's fine. But as a default, look for IC9 code starting with 414. Okay. So I'll make the changes and you guys should see the changes in the sandbox. Thank you. And for people that are on the line listening for the RSTs, don't get alarmed at all this detail. It's behind the scenes um, and for the most part not something that you'll have to be worrying about unless you have to go searching for it. Um, so it may seem daunting. Um, to hear all this stuff, um, but if it's hidden from you, um, you can take a look and see what it's searching for the way that Andy showed by right clicking and uh, clicking edit and you'll see what's underneath the hood, but you won't necessarily have to go there unless you have to. That's all I have to say there, Andy. You can go on if no one has any comments. Okay, so for chronic pain, um, this one is looking for uh, 338.4 in the uh, patient's problem list. Okay, you can see that code in the, this patient's problem list. And again, just an add-on for everybody, this is not something that a lot of physicians will be used to unless they've taken the chronic pain module. And you do have a cheat sheet that helps people um, look for their patients who have uh, chronic pain by looking at all patients who are on opioids and various other things, looking for um, text searches such as um, chronic low back pain or low back pain or chronic headaches or those kinds of things. Um, so uh, this will be one that a lot of people may not be familiar with and uh, may require uh, a little bit more context uh, to them, uh, especially um, valuable to point them to the chronic pain module. Okay, uh, for the next group, COPD. Uh, this one, there's a macro attached to this group where it's looking for uh, codes that are 490, 491, 492, 494, and 496. And again, if you run anything that has a macro, it will take some time to pull the data in. 
And again, I'll have to make a change to this one because you're looking for uh, starting with. Yep. Thank you. So for the heart failure group, this one should be looking for code, um, the description of heart failure, but I'll go ahead and change this to 428 unless um, yeah. you guys have a different suggestion for that. No, 428 is what you should be starting with 428. Okay, so 428 is right here. I made the changes. And can you just check on the COPV again and just look at the macro of what it's looking for? Sorry. 490, it should be 490, 491, 492, 494, and 496. Yep, good. Got it. Great. Good job, Andy. Should that one be starts with two as well, Bruce? Or? Yes, it should be. Yep. All these ones should all be start with except for 338.4 and uh, the Dimension 331.0. So for the heart failure, you can you can see the diagnostic code 428. Okay. Uh, for the next group for active patients. <laughs> Um, this will indicate all your active patients who have been seen by the physician at least once within the past three years. That's the one we we're talking. Sorry, Andy, I had talked about that one earlier on, so you do have that report here. Okay, that so for this one, I, I built um, a stored query and I attached it to this group. For our stored query, if you want to view the variables for it, you just need to hit edit stored query. And right here, we can see the variables for their date last seen, and it's today minus three years, and their patient status is equal to active. Beautiful. Okay, and here you can see the output. Uh, for our dep depression group, this one is looking for diagnostic code 311 in their problem list. Okay, you can see code 311 here. For hypertension, um, again, I'll need to change this to 24401 instead of the word hypertension. So if we just pull this group, you can see 401s in this list. And lastly, and, for... And just back one thing, sorry, Daniel, um, just back one thing to um, the depression. You were looking for 311 um, or uh, starts with 296. Okay, I'll make the changes after. Thank you. Okay, and lastly for our diabetes group, uh, this one needs to be changed to 250. Let's open up the clinical details on their problems. We should see code 250 in their problem list. And so this wraps up the patient panel uh, in terms of the reports. Well, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Just one comment to the diabetes. Um, again, we've spoken about this in uh, earlier at earlier webinar. Um, many may have 
diabetes incorrectly labeled because they're capturing people who have impaired glucose tolerance or on the way to diabetes but don't have it. Um, so there's lab values, hemoglobin A1C, um, some other tips of how to search for um, patients that truly have diabetes that's included in a handout that's been uh, gone out to everybody earlier. Andy, could you just go back to active patients and run that again? I'd, I'm wondering if, because it's a test or a sandbox, did you see the data last contact or it has future dates on it? Mm -hmm. I've just never seen that before. This is the first time I've seen it. Um, there may be a bug. I'll need to run that through product services and get that checked out. Um, it should not affect uh, on an actual database, but... Okay. Yeah, and I would, like I was saying, maybe it's just because it's the sandbox. Thank you. And if it's math, I had, um, I had a little bit of a glitch happen, too, with that date of last contact. Um, when the data conversion occurred from when our clinic went from Clinicare to IntraHealth, there was, a, like, one date, but some of the patients that showed up as a last contact of 2009 had encounters for this year. And so I'm not exactly sure what happened there. I, I had IntraHealth working on it, but I, I found a better way to, to just to do that data cleanup is to search by last um, date of encounter on the, um, in stored queries. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Andy. Um, I'm just we have a, we do have a few minutes left. I want to make sure that we end on time, but we do have a few minutes left. I just wondered, Andy, um, if you if we might take any questions. We sent some um, some of the the login information um, out yesterday. Aaron Picard amended it for us to the meeting invite, which um, would have been the instructions for you folks to access the sandbox. Andy, I know that there's going to need to be some changes made now, so will that affect, like, will the sandbox be disabled for a period of time while we're making the revisions, or how will that work? Um, it is currently down right now. I just checked with product services. Uh, there seems to be an issue with the move to our data center. Um, I think it may be best, for, I know for at some of the health authorities, you guys can't install profile uh, because you're blocked behind some firewall restrictions. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a second option of having a Citrix environment and that should eliminate any issues with connectivity. Would that be a better option for the people that can't connect or that can't install on their local computers? Yeah, Andy, um, this is Merlin from Island Health. Um, we definitely, it's, it's quite an issue to install software on our devices. It'd be a very time consuming process to get it approved. Um, I know you had an environment about a year ago running through Citrix that I was able to access with no issues. So if you could have a similar process, I think it would work. Okay, I'd be willing I'll, to test it to get it going. Okay, I'll put in a request today, um, and then I will let Kelsey know when that's up and running, and I'll provide you guys all with the login information for that Citrix environment. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, sorry, there's a question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? It's Joe uh, Stiles from Interior. Um, so Ron and I are working with a number of the interior health um, clinics with profiles that are doing uh, primary care home work. And we're actually trying to work with IMIT to create these stored queries. We haven't started yet, but we've built sort of a tactical plan in order to do so. Is it possible to have um, these loaded into an interior health clinic rather than sort of reinventing the wheel? So you want to load it onto an existing site that runs profile? 
Um, I will be uploading Java files for clinics to import into their system. Uh, so you won't need to manually um, build these queries and stuff like that. Uh, okay. And again, so even though it's an interior health version, it's a different version than it would be in an independent position, yeah. we'll still be able to have that loaded at the site? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I did. So that's going to yeah, save a ton of work. <laughs> we did check with, with them because that was a question. Um, and so there might need to be some provisions made from the IT department at the health authority just around allowing it, but um, it should be compatible with the intra-health version. That's great. Can I, can I hop onto that? I work with a couple of VCH clinics and they have profile, but they don't even have access to groups or stored queries. And so we're having a really hard time searching anything. Would, would that be the same as Interior, would, that you could put it into their system? Uh, so, Candice, yeah, so what, like what, what we sort of established with um, Stephanie's team is that it's not that it's not compatible, it's not that it's not compatible, it's just that the health authority may have functions turned off. So we, in terms of like you might still need to go through the health authority as a middleman for them to, um, it's not like that they're not hosting versions that don't have this, it's just that they've elected to, to actually turn certain things off. So I can't say definitively, but I would, I would assume that you would need to raise it with it, like it would need to be something downloaded by the IT department at the health authority. You, you and do functions have it. may need to be yeah. turned on. Yeah. My my do, problem yeah. is that it's just so hard to get through. I know I know that they've just locked certain features, and it makes it almost impossible to do any of this kind of quality, you know, searching data cleanup. And so I was just hoping that if if we were able to just put it in, <laughs> that'd be great. But yeah, no, I understand the whole health authority thing. So thanks, so. Yeah. Well, maybe if it becomes, you know, if it's like Joanne said, if it becomes sort of prevalent work through patient um, medical home stuff or what have you, um, premier care home work, then might get a bit more attention. But my my understanding from IntraHealth is that it's, they're all hosting versions that can do this. It's just whether or not they've elected to turn the functions off, on or off, as you said. Right. Thank you. So, okay, is there any other questions for Andy or Bruce? Okay, well, if anything comes up after the fact, you know how to get a hold of us. Um, so, Andy and I will work on making the changes we've talked about today. And thanks very much for your patience. Like Bruce said, this is a lot of detail and a lot of it is maybe not necessarily the level of detail you need, but it's a very worthwhile exercise to make sure that we've got it right. So thanks for your patience with this today and your feedback. Um, we'll have to set, resend updated documentation and links um, to the, to the um, uh, sandbox environment as well as um, we'll keep you posted about the ability to get it like an Ocitrix option. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, reconnect with the leads and just make sure that you guys have um, the, just have the, the right sort of clinic criteria to be asking. So as you're out there um, figuring out who might be some of the clinics that you'll be doing this work with. Again, we'll just need you to um, be recording some really basic information about the practice so that IntraHealth can be turning this on. So I'll, I'll work through the uh, connect with the leads today to make sure that we've got that down and, and that's disseminated to you guys. Um, and yeah, so we'll work towards getting you guys this stuff by the end of the week. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please let us know. As well, um, as the pilots go live and as, um, you know, I'm sure this work will start and there'll be, of course, questions that are coming up, we will, um, I'll be working with Aaliyah to make sure that there's um, time built into the, um, oh gosh, I'm going to get the name right wrong. I think it's the learning cafes that you guys have been having um, with her to make sure that we have a, a place to come together and to um, ask questions um, around this and, and help get some support um, for you on that piece. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that, we'll, you know, there's going to be other touch points around this. Um, I think that's all I have to say. So thanks so much, 
Andy for your time today and Bruce as well. That was um, your, your feedback is so integral. So thank you for making the time. And thanks everyone for your time. We'll wrap up, it's just with one minute to go and we'll be in touch shortly with the um, amended um, documents. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Bye. Thank you.